Hi, my name is Steve Schnurr, and I am the Worldwide Executive of Music uh, for EA, otherwise known as Electronic Arts. Uh, we are here right now in a pretty significantly sized conference room at EA in LA. EA Electronic Arts is the uh, world's biggest game developer, software developer. Um, EA uh, creates um, video game franchises such as Madden NFL, the Sims, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, uh, Need for Speed, um, and many, many others. Uh, EA is number one around the world, uh, and uh, number two, three, four, and others combined aren't as big as the in the market share uh, as EA. As a matter of fact, there was about 30 uh, something titles put out last year by this company. Uh, every single one of them. Uh, sold at least a million units, um, about six or seven sold over five, sometimes seven million units. So the, the reach is pretty significant from, from uh, what I call the musical real estate within each game. My role at EA is, sometimes I say it is to ensure uh, that every note counts. I think that I'm responsible for every note that goes in every game we create, be it a licensed song, be it a created song, an original song, be it a score, um, be it an underscore, be it an end title, whatever the case may be, I'm inevitably uh, charged to ensure that uh, uh, musically it matters, emotionally it matters, um, and so on. I'm also responsible for the marketing of that music on a global basis, so anything we do with that music, whether it be a program online through a DSP, uh, whether it be uh, an artist being involved, a music artist pr involved in promoting our games, whether it be involved in uh, soundtracks, whether it be whatever the case may be, our music publishing assets, um, you know, ultimately I guess I'm in charge of that. Well, you know, there's, a, there's different ways we use music in each and every title. And uh, I think at first you have to kind of be compared to the film industry. I mean, certain films, you know, have a score which sort of uh, is under the action that maybe sometimes you don't even realize is there, but it's certainly uh, responsible sometimes for 51 plus percent of the emotional impact you're getting. It's the equivalent of, you know, uh, maybe Tom Cruise, you know, running in Mission Impossible, running from the top of the train, jumping over the top of the train. I mean, the music inevitably is what is going to make you sweat more, whether you realize it or not. Because uh, usually, uh, most of the time, you don't even realize uh, the composition that was there. Um, but it's doing its job if, if it's done correctly. So, I mean, we have that done by proper composers with proper orchestras uh, in our, you know, Harry Potter series, uh, Lord of the Rings series, um, Medal of Honor, Command and Conquer, um, whether it's licensed IP or it's original uh, IP ultimately, you know, these are very filmatic in approach, and we feel that uh, uh, the music, again, just like a film, is responsible for you know a significant portion of uh, your emotional uh, participation. Um, certain things aren't necessarily underscore. Certain things are actually. Uh, let's take it one step further. Let's call it interactive score. Um, interactive score, uh, which is usually used in many of our titles, is where. Um, the score is not a linear composition like it is in a film with a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's composed of stems upon stems upon stems. So every turn that a gamer makes uh, with his or his, his or her controller will tell us where one stem will go to another. So maybe in an odd way you never even end up hearing the same score twice. Uh, if you're running through the woods hypothetically and you trip on a log and the monster's coming, and obviously this is a hypothetical, you know, the score takes a certain turn. If you keep on running and you don't trip over the log and you make a left turn and you get away, certainly that stem would would trigger another stem which would have a much happier ending to it. Um, so it's a much different process. It's certainly not, again, I'm using the keyword linear. It's not linear. It's completely interactive. Um, certain things, particularly like um, uh, arcade types of games or sports games, I think those deserve more licensed types of songs. Uh, it's a little more, you have to sort of emulate what happens in real life, and although I've always said sort of my goal was to have the live experience of football, the live experience of basketball eventually sound like the uh, virtual experience versus the vice versa, where, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to have ACDC and Queen, you know, in a football video game. Uh, I think we've come we, we've achieved that now the NFL um, 
ensures that all the music in Madden NFL gets played in all of their stadiums now. So aside from Gary Glitter or ACDC, you know, and Giant Stadium, hypothetically, you're going to hear, you know, bands like Atreyu or in whatever, you know, that, that first appeared in a Madden game. But, you know, this is a license thing where you have to find the right music that has the right, um, sets the right... Um, environment, it sets the right um, mood, it really has to pump you up and get you sort of invigorated to go, you know, kick someone else's, you know what. Um, and that becomes an, another process which we can get into. I mean, we, cho we choose a more MTV-ish uh, environment where it's a real sense of discovery here, new bands, you know, um, new compositions, new songs, whatever the case may be. Everybody has their own, you know, different uh, game companies that have their own sort of vision on that. Um, and one of the other things we do, frankly, is a lot of original music. So certain certain games will have, like The Sims, for instance, we will have uh, original composers writing, original songwriters, sorry, writing uh, specific songs for the game. Um, and these are huge songwriters we have, guys that have number one records on various charts. You know, we'll have writing. It's not uh, an internal thing anymore like it was when it all started five, six years ago. One thing that we chose to do here at EA, other game companies have not, is that we feel that first and foremost it's important for people, particularly younger people, to have a place to discover new music. You know, we all went through it. I don't care whether you're 40, whether you're 30, or you're 20. We all know the first time when we heard U2 or Nirvana or Eminem or the police. doesn't matter. The bottom line is, and we all sort of had those bragging rights, because music when you're young, and let's define young as being 12 to... 20 something, you know, 24 maybe, you know, music uh, it creates your own identity. And there's very few people that don't feel that way. And most people don't want to be musical followers. They want to hear something for the first time and they get excited and they love the idea that they have bragging rights to others, particularly gamers. You know, it's all about, you know, you know, one-upping somebody and things like that. So that was the first and foremost reason why we decided that musical discovery, what better real estate? Uh, Radio has sort of, you know, through consolidation, through what's happened in the last, you know, 10 plus years, you know, has had less of an exciting playlist. You know, there's almost, dare I say, almost a national playlist now uh, since a lot of these uh, radio stations have consolidated into one bigger, you know, some bigger umbrellas. Um, and those are dictated what song is safe to play, what song is not safe to play. You know, and the people who lose are those younger people that love to discover something. Um, you know, MTV and other music video channels, not to their fault, you know, they, they decided, and they probably rightly so decided, that um, it was the right, their real estate was more value in programs and creating various programs, and I think their ratings benefited from that idea. So that was the right thing to do. But again, what suffers there is the amount of young, discoverable bands. Um, now, simultaneously, if you look at the research, we know that people between the ages of 12 to 24, particularly males, spend more time uh, either online or with their video game controllers, uh, consoles, than they are watching TV or, or, you know, listening to the radio. So that's some pretty valuable musical real estate. So we decided it would be a real uh, effort towards better consumer satisfaction to know that when somebody bought Madden or somebody bought NBA Live or Burnout or Need for Speed, that aside from a great gaming experience, that is the first and foremost reason why they're buying it, you know, because they discovered, hypothetically, one or two bands last year that inevitably became their favorite bands. Wow, I wonder who I'm going to discover this year. It's a reliability factor. Um, certainly, you know, it costs less to put a younger band in than a bigger band. But one thing we have not done was shave budgets. What we did was we've maintained the same financial pie. We just divide it up a little differently. You know, before, if you go out there and hypothetically license an ACDC track or a Queen track, it takes the whole darn budget. You know, what we've done now is ensured that we divide it up by 20 or divide it up by 30. Um, so we're not spending less. You know, um, we're spending the same, sometimes more, because obviously time has increased the need for more budgets, bigger budgets. But, um, you know, we felt that it's a better way for gamers to be assured that, you know, they're always going to know what's happening. We say that when you, bu when you buy Madden NFL 2007, you'll never hear music from 2006. And inevitably, further, we say that, you know, this is what your season is going to sound like. And we ensure that now through the NFL, for instance, taking those soundtracks and playing it in stadiums, it really defines what football is going to sound like. I noticed, for instance, last year that 
Fox and some other broadcasters that broad, broadcast football are using songs from the Madden uh, soundtrack as outros when they go to commercials. So, you know, everybody benefits then. Um, but particularly, really, it's about consumer satisfaction. Mm -hmm. It's about gamers, first and foremost. And if gamers said tomorrow, frankly, in the beauty of this business, if they said tomorrow, look, we really want, you know, all Burt Backrack music, which, you know, I don't know necessarily is going to happen, but if they said that, you know, we would listen. And what we listen to now is the fact that they want a place to discover something new. They can't get it elsewhere. Most of our research, when it, musically speaking, is done uh, in hindsight. You know, it's fairly impossible to say to somebody, what do you want to hear in the games coming out in six months? Because they'll tell you stuff that they know. They can't tell you stuff that they don't know. So we can only look in back and say, hey, which of the bands that you heard last year did you love? Which of the bands did you buy their record? Which of the bands did you go to some online site, whether it be legal or illegal, whatever the case may be? Which band did you become a fan of? Do you depend on us to discover new music? And that's what drives us forward. You know, there's always inevitably the, uh, you know, older person who wants jazz and the older person who says, you know, I want to hear more Queen and Gary Glitter, but, you know, musically speaking, you know, we really concentrate on 12 to 24 year olds. Even though the gaming audience is sort of widespread in both directions, those are the people that we feel are sort of more musically aware and musically active, um, you know, and depend on us. Um, so. Uh, again, research is done in hindsight, musically speaking. It's impossible to sort of predict the future musically and have and research against it. It just it can't be done. Nobody can tell you, oh yeah, I want to hear you know more Bishop Lamont, which is going to be in this year's when they don't even know who Bishop Lamont is yet. The gaming audience varies from uh, game to game. I mean, uh, Madden football is everyone you can man imagine, primarily North American. Um, predominantly guys, I can find you seven-year-olds and I can find you 50-year-olds that play Madden and, you know, everybody in between. Uh, Sims is different. Sims uh, is 60% plus female. Uh, it's 50, maybe even 51% international, and that just isn't Europe. That's Asia, South America. Um, you know, it's a game that has sold over 60 million units. So you do the math on that, and you put a song in there. It's a pretty significant, um, you know, level of exposure. Um, games like Burnout and Need for Speed, which are a little more arcade racing games. You know, this the female quotient raises up a bit. Uh, not to the level of Sims, but it certainly raises up a bit. Uh, and again, in those cases, you have, you know, European audiences, you have Asian audiences, you have North American audiences. Games like FIFA, uh, which is, from a, from a perspective of a sports game, sells more than Madden, but, you know, X percent, the predominant percent sells in Europe. Um, you know, we'll do a million units here in the U.S., which is significant, but you'll do, you know, six million plus units in Europe. Um, so it really varies. But you can assume that sports games, you know, are predominantly male. Sims is, you know, predominantly female, but, you know, not to a, an overwhelming majority, you know, 60 percent. Uh, and the more arcade like the game, you know, the female uh, quotient, um, you know, rises. You know, we feel that the benefits, the marketing benefits, aside from the fact that, you know, we pay for a license uh, of a song to be in a game, um, the majority of the benefits come in exposure and marketing, um, and it varies. I mean, how many uh, mediums, you know, offer this level of instantaneous mass exposure as a video game? The fact that you can have a song in a game like FIFA or Madden NFL and be heard, we know, and I'll go through the math in a moment here, uh, the level of exposure is uh, a song will be heard more than the number one record in, of every country around the world. Here's the math. We know, for instance, if somebody buys a game... Uh, it, it's not an individual um, uh, act. I mean, in other words, we, we share it. You, uh, it's a social activity is my point. So I'll play a game, and I'll play it with my buddy and his buddy. The average is 2.5 people play each game, okay, each game purchase. 
uh, each of us, particularly on a game, the average is 50 hours, but it raises up on games like Madden and other sports games. It'll be 90 to 100 hours each of us. So there's two and a half people playing on that average of, let's say, 90 to 100 hours each. Uh, we'll put songs in to rotate about two times an hour during typical gameplay because um, we know basically the way people typically play games, how much time they spend in menus, et cetera, et cetera. We chyre on them. We brought that in five years ago, you know, those couple lines on the bottom left, which we all know from MTV, I think, you know, the days of uh, play it when you say it, I mean, radio, or say it when you play it, sorry, radio still, uh, you know, you still wait around and wait for them to tell you what you heard and you don't get it, but I think most younger people uh, who are brought up in MTV expect to be told, they want to be told visually what it is they're hearing. Anyway, uh, you do that, you sell, you know, six, seven, eight, nine million copies of a Madden or, an, or a FIFA, and you do the math on that, and basically the amount of spins that has occurred is over a billion. So that's some significant exposure. There is not a band that I know of that we have put in a game, and I don't care if it's Green Day to, you know, a Treyu. I don't care what level, if it's a band that's sort of like happening but beginning to, you know, get recognition or a band that has been around for a decade. There is not one of those bands that, is, that has not come up to me when I've met them and said, you know, X percent of kids at a gig every single night come up and say, oh my God, I heard you in Madden, I heard you in FIFA. There have been bands from Switzerland we've put in uh, FIFA that are getting emails and participation in blogs from Brazil and Japan. Uh, I'll tell you a great example just happened. Uh, there was an artist we put from Trinidad uh, in FIFA last year, and um, he ended up performing recently at the World Cup and uh, has never gotten radio exposure, nothing, only in FIFA last year, and he wrote me a note and said, it, if you could have only seen tens of thousands of people singing every word to the song I was singing that was in FIFA. So, I mean, it's that level of exposure. You know, you're, it, this is, and I'm using a bit, a bit of a uh, marketing cliche here, but this is lean forward entertainment. This isn't like a radio where you're driving and you're doing something in its background. This is something where you are focused, you are forward, uh, you know, you're seeing the information, you're shaping your own soundtrack for the music that you just, you know, discovered. You're deciding what you like, what you don't like, and it's a part of the particip it's parti you're participating, you know, in the soundtrack and the broadcast, for lack of a better term, you know, itself. So, um, that's the marketing benefit. Now, that doesn't account for the other things we do. If you go to EA.com, which is a significantly traveled site because gamers want to go there and see what's coming up, again, it talks about all the bands that you just heard in the game. It gives you 60-second streams. It gives you information where they're touring. You know, just anything that you need to become a fan of that band. Uh, we'll go 10 steps further. Uh, we've got the launch of Madden for Madden 2007, and five of the 35 bands are going to be uh, on the Kimmel Show each night. Uh, and we're the ones that book them on there with the Kimmel Show. You know, these are the bands from Madden. We've got bands on the gaming sites like IGN and GameSpots, where instead of just giving away the visuals from a game, you know, we'll attach, you know, a new band. We'll attach Rise Against, for instance, as the as the music, and we'll chyron it. So you'll get the new visuals from Madden, you know, but like a mini video, but with Madden footage. And, you know, we'll expose it in that way. Um, there's a lot of ways we get involved with taking it 10 steps further. Um, and that's some significant marketing. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, the worst case scenario is the greatest case scenario, which is you get programmed into the game itself, it gets rotated, and it gets heard by, you know, millions and millions and millions of people. That's not a worst case scenario. You know, about five years ago when I started here, I'd say about almost 100% of all songs uh, that we were potentially going to license in, we had to go out and seek out. Nobody really understood how valuable the real estate would be. Musicians didn't understand it. Certainly record companies didn't understand it. Um, and it's changed a lot. I'd say now, five years later, about 100% of the music we put in uh, is brought to us, is solicited in. Uh, and I'd say the people that understand that the most are the artists, the bands themselves. I think the reason why is because most of them are gamers. You know, I used to, uh, years ago when I worked at record companies, I used to be with a band and we'd be driving to a radio station, whatever the case may be, and they heard their song on the radio and it was the greatest moment of their lives. It was their equivalent of quote unquote making it. And I don't think that exists anymore. I think now from so many artists, rock artists, hip hop artists, uh, their definition of making it is hearing their song in Madden because that's what they do. Or hearing the song in Need for Speed. How do I get my song in there?
you know, and I've been with many young bands and they, they play it for the first time and their song comes up and they freak out. They go nuts. They can't believe it. So the process is, um, you know, us sort of surveying the landscape for a year. Because, again, we're programming a game from between, hypothetically, December and May that comes out August or September. So how can you don't want to put any music in that has come out in that period of time? You don't want, you want to ensure that when somebody plays that game in September, they're hearing a song that they might not even hear on the radio for another six months. So you need to you can't rely on licensing groups. You have to rely on direct relationships, manager direct relationships, lawyer direct relationships. Most bands we end up going in the studio with them before they even start recording. Um, because they are recording along the lines of delivering, so uh, delivering a song to get in on time to a certain game. Of course, we also line it up with record companies. If they're signed to a major or an independent uh, label, what we like to assure is that, you know, if the song ships to radio hypothetically in, fe in February, sometimes the record company will work with us that we put it in a game that comes out in December to sort of warm the marketplace, so to speak. But with a lot of unsigned bands or, or new bands or real independent bands, you know, we'll go in there and we'll say, okay, the deadline for Madden is May, you know, and we'll go in in March when the song is half recorded and hear it and say, well, that song's right for Madden, that song's not right for Madden, and we'll work to get that finished in time. So it's a real process. We get inundated with music. I mean, there is so much music here that we get sent to us, and it's a huge process. But And we'll go through thousands, I mean, sometimes three, four, five thousand 5,000 songs to, to dwindle, dwindle down to a final list of 30-something that make it into Madden. Um, we have weekly music meetings, uh, you know, music has to be solicited, just like, you know, record companies, you know, only accept music that's solicited. But we have a pretty vast network around the world who solicit to us. Um, and remember, this isn't just North America. I mean, for FIFA, we have the same aim with Discovery Music. Uh, we'll have musicians from Ghana, from Brazil, from China, from Singapore, from the Netherlands, you know, and so on. So we're doing it for, on an international basis. The rights of licensing music into video games are, again, very similar to the film industry. You know, um, there are two sides. There's the master side uh, and there's the publishing side, which is a sync. You know, you're syncing it up to a visual element. So there's two people to pay. Um, and we approach it that way. It's also very similar and we model it very much like the film industry in that, you know, there are buyouts. Um, there's no participation. Um, I think that's pretty much become the industry standard right now. Um, uh, there is participation uh, for composers, which we'll get to a little later on here, not in game rights, but in other opportunities, third, you know, third party opportunities down the line, extracurricular things we do with scores. But when it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, licensed music, you know, it's pretty much two sides that uh, there's a license request that goes to whoever owns that license and they sign off on it and negotiate a fee with us and, um, and then we're good to go. We do and we don't do soundtracks. First of all, we don't do physical soundtracks because I don't even believe people, some people in the record business want to be in the record business anymore. So we don't exactly, uh, you know, press 12 songs from a game onto a CD and put it out to retail. It's just, you know, the math doesn't add up for that. However, we are in the uh, digital, uh, you know, service provider soundtrack world. However, uh, it's sometimes a difficult task, you know, to get because inevitably you want to sell 15 tracks or 14 tracks for 9.99, I think, which is the typical album price on iTunes. And you know, and you've got different songs from different labels, and it's their participation and their math, and you know, it's something we just don't choose to necessarily con consistently get our hands dirty with. It's too much work for too little return, to be frank with you. It would behoove them, and I'll say this to you, that if a label, when they are uploading their song to iTunes later on for sale, it would behoove them to actually add uh, Madden NFL or EA Sports to the metadata because people are searching that. And I've had some labels who get that and some labels who don't. But inevitably, if a kid, you know, hears a Treyu, and I'm actually, you know, I'm using just a hypothetical, uh, and a kid goes in and punches in EA Sports and iTunes, that song should come up. Many labels don't do that, which I think is a bit foolish, to be honest with you. Um, that said, 
uh, soundtracks. We have put together digital soundtracks uh, in the past. Uh, we've gone in there and um, put our own music up there. Uh, we do. There's plenty of things that we participate in, such as our NFL film remixes in Madden and our scores. And um, these are things that we wholly own or partially own. And we will do. Um, we will sell soundtracks digitally speaking. We have a uh, partnership with Network, and they are our, they are our um, digital marketing division, so to speak. Um, and anywhere where music is legally sold around the world, you can get the soundtrack to Metal. Of Honor, you can get the soundtrack to The Sims, you can get the beats of NBA Live, you can get the NFL remixes uh, from Madden, um, and so on and so on. So these are things that we believe, you know, are part of the future and the sort of horizontal approach of, of game space. In other words, you know, uh, the level of entertainment we can provide, musically speaking, you should be able to, you know, buy those beats that you love. And hey, if you want to throw them into, you know, some program and create an original song against it, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Songs that are, are originally created for the game, uh, any song that's licensed into the game or created for the game becomes, uh, in that case, sometimes a work for hire, sometimes a license, depending on it. Um, songs that are created for The Sims, you know, are our songs. They, they become work for hire, just like scores. Um, however, there are writer shares involved, and we'll get to that in a moment with Composer. So when we do go out there and exploit it further on iTunes or through our music publishing company, which we can get to in a moment, uh, you know, there's a writer share to collect for the writer. So that's where he or she can sort of, you know, make more money down the line. But anything that is uh, thematic to our game, and this is the same as a film company, same as an, anima an animated film companies, whatever the case may be, you know, we, we end up owning that property. It's, it's an essential ingredient. We, can, we can't uh, have a Sims theme, hypothetically, which is written by somebody and, and not own that. Um, but uh, songs are written uh, for The Sims. Sometimes we'll have partial ownerships of songs, um, you know, for songs in Madden, because our publishing company will have these great producers, these hip hop producers, and they'll bring in an artist to do a song for it, and then by default we end up owning 50%. So, you know, for the most part, though, most songs that are directly licenses from labels and publishing companies, you know, we don't participate in. About uh, five, six, seven years ago, the game industry was primarily, um, uh, musically speaking, was primarily um, comprised of, of in-house audio guys who happen to be musicians. And uh, it's a bit of a silly analogy, but can you imagine, you know, again, uh, if this was Paramount Pictures or this was Warner Brothers Pictures and we did a film, uh, you know, a 50, 75, 100 million dollar film in eight weeks in a post, we said, oh my god, we don't have any music. Hey, go get John. He plays guitar sometimes. Let's see if he can throw something together uh, so we can just have some music in here. It's a, it sounds silly, but it's pretty much the way it was. Um, what we decided to do five years ago, because this industry was running around constantly saying how much bigger we were than the film industry, I kept saying it was time to start sounding bigger than the film industry, or at least sounding as big as the film industry. So we handle our hiring composers and our recording of scores exactly the same as the film industry. Uh, there's no such thing as a video game composer to me. There's great composers, there's average composers, there's lousy composers. We seek to hire great great composers no matter what medium they come from. Michael Giacchino started in this space. He actually started in Medal of Honor. He was an interactive composer. Went on to do Lost, Alias, Mission Impossible 3. He's doing scores for me now. He's back. He's a great composer no matter what medium he's scoring against. We've had uh, composers like Trevor Jones and Bill Conti who you know have dozens and dozens and dozens of amazing films in their filmography. Uh, have done scores here. Uh, we have guys like Sean Callery, who does 24 on TV, an amazing composer, um, has done uh, game scores for us. Um, so it doesn't matter what the background is. The bottom line is we, we do it exactly the same. We look at the property. We look at the type of music that needs to go into that property. We look at various composers. We look at the personality of the composers. We look at their willingness and understanding of the medium, their eagerness, and many times their eagerness is very high even if they've never done a game before. And we hire them based on that. We'll go in and we will record with the same orchestras on the same stages that the, a huge film will do. We've recorded on the Fox stage here in L.A. and we've recorded on the Sony stage here in L.A. and the Paramount stage and so on and so on. We've recorded a bunch of things like the last Bond we did in Harry Potter we'll do with the London Symphony Orchestra in London at Air Studios. And you know, sometimes you go union, sometimes you go non-union. That's the sort of same dilemma that the film industry goes through. But the bottom line is there's no different in the quality. There's no different 
difference in the quality of musicianship, no difference in the quality or level of composer. The only difference, which is a major difference, is the way the score is written. Because again, a score is not a linear score. It is, doesn't have an A, B, C, D, E. It's written in stem. So it could be 70 minutes, 90 minutes of music, and you will never hear the same score twice. No matter where you are in the gameplay, that affects where the score goes. And many guys who have been making films for their whole life love the idea of that. They think it's just an interesting, really cool new way to compose music, um, knowing that you know everybody has a choice as to the inevitable outcome of that score. So I think that has had a lot to do with the fact that we've attracted some of the biggest names mm -hmm. there are in this town and in Europe when it comes to, you know, composers. Aside from the fact that if they're young, they play games, and if they're older, if they don't play games, their kids play games, mm -hmm. and it's a relatively cool thing for them to do. Music, uh, when it comes to video game music that is done... Um, for filmatic type of games where score is created, it's done in, in stems. Uh, you will have a piece of music that will go here, but instead of continu continuing the linear line that a music w piece of music would normally have in a film, at some point those notes, those eight notes, that one minute, whatever the case may be, will have a choice of five ways to go. And each of those ways will have another five ways to go. So let's say all of a sudden, and bear with me here through my you know, vocal example, let's say the music goes, you know, and um, actually I'll use something that isn't written. I was about to use something and realized you'd have to get a license for it. Let's make something up, okay? You know, dun 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 Okay, dun 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 No matter what it is, and I'm not sitting here saying I'm writing a score, it depends where you are. If dun 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 Let's say all of a sudden something happened in the game, something terrible happened. You don't want to have dun 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 You know, it's got to go somewhere, you know, that sort of, you know, musically illustrates, you know, where you are. So that stem con connects with five stems. Those stems connect with, connect with another five, connect with another five, and it goes on. So sometimes the scores are written in, you know, one-minute pieces, then 30-second pieces, then... You know, and, and it's really interesting um, and challenging. It's a puzzle for a composer. And since math, you know, is a, I guess, a large part of a musician's character, understanding, you know, mathematics, so to speak, you know, it becomes a bit of a, you know, again, I'm using the same word twice, but it becomes a bit of a puzzle in that regard. And I think many guys find that very, very interesting. Uh, to do a score that way. You know, it might be exhausting. I have no idea. They all look happy at the end, but it might be exhausting, and maybe they go, God, I'm doing a film next, because that's easy. Um, but uh, also, i got to mention one thing. Uh, unlike a film where the music uh, is done in post, a, mu a, a musical piece in games is not done in post. It's done during production. There's no visual. You don't go into the studio to record it at the end and then, you know, conduct against some piece of visual. You're giving storylines. You know, you're giving scenarios. So it gives you the ability to sort of musically envision what's happening. It's not like, you know, you see you or I running. It doesn't exist, you know. There, we're in a field, and there's an army, and they're shooting at us, and we fall, and we're dead. Whatever the case may be, that's it. And now you can explore a little more musically what it is. You can use your own vision, your own mind, which I think musicians love. There's much less dictation, so to speak, visually speaking. There's a storyline, and there's the inevitable, the initial challenge of, you know, I want something blue, you want something blue. Does your definition musically of blue differ from my definition? But that comes with relationships, and that's why it's always important to hire the right composer who, who if they don't necessarily see eye to eye with the audio team here, then at least they, they seek to understand each other's definition. I think the video game industry is pirated, by the way. Um, you know, it, it, you can build um, a, a, an analogy to the record industry in the sense that if you go to countries around the world like China and places like that where piracy has always been an issue for music, you know, you will see, you know, a thousand copies of a video game of which only one was sold. Uh, you know, and the other thousand, you know, the point I'm trying to make is that there's a lot of pirating going on. Um, the difference between the video game industry um, and other industries is that technology is always moving forward. In other words, by the time people are able to pirate or download or file share copies of a PS2 game or an Xbox game, we're already moving the marketplace into the next generation console. So we're 10 steps ahead. You know, I think it's, I think while the record industry, and I say this 
it's going to sound a bit negative, and I come from the record industry, so I say this with respect, but um, but caution is that, you know, the record industry is still trying to, at times, hang on to the CD, which has been around for 20-something years, you know, and how do we get people to stay in that format? What this industry does is they try to get people to move to the next format. And it's not an issue of battling piracy. It's an, it's an issue of how our games become better. You know, the, 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 all of the visuals and the content, and everything becomes better um, when you move to the amount of information that you can put on PS3 uh, or, or 360 or whatever the case may be. So I'd say we stay ahead of the technology. And we're moving to new technologies, so piracy always has to catch up. Um, I think uh, another interesting thing is, particularly in parts of the world like Asia, is that um, the game industry there is becoming predominantly online, uh, less physical goods. So will piracy go away? I would say that if the online business continues to flourish and you're able to play people, one person's in Korea, another person's in Japan, and whatever the case may be, and our entire game experience is online, uh, and we're updating and doing microtransactions on a consistent basis, you know, and sharing and buying, then physical goods, the piracy of physical goods, goes away. Uh, I would imagine in the next five to ten years, we're going to see physical goods in our space in North America go away as well. You're going to be able to purchase games, you know, the base games online, download it, whatever the case may be, and have consistent microtransactions with people around the world to buy new uniforms, buy new guns, buy new footballs, buy whatever the case may be. Um, I'm sure there will be a new level of piracy or a different type of piracy at that point, but I think, again, the core difference is that we work with and towards new technologies, and other mediums try to save their current technologies. And I think there's something to be learned from that. You know, I think, frankly, uh, probably one of the worst things that the record industry did was fight new technology five plus years ago, and now it's just a matter of catch up. The video game industry isn't catching up. The video, the video game industry is, you know, moving forward. If you're a musician, uh, whether it's a composer or you're a guy in a band or a girl in a band, um, you know, you need to network. Uh, you know, how would you get a record deal, whether it's today or whether it was 15 years ago? You need to network. You need to know people. You need to play out. You need to uh, heighten your awareness. Uh, at EA, we don't follow charts. It doesn't matter whether you're number 10 in the chart, because we're, we're not interested in something that's out right now. We're trying to future for forecast, musically speaking. But we are spending a lot of time online. We're looking in places like MySpace and YouTube and, you know, whatever places will come in the future, you know, Tag World, whatever the case may be, we're trying to see people's interest, real people's interest in bands. We do pay attention to that on an international basis. We're paying attention to clubs around the world. We're paying attention to mixtapes. We're paying attention to local scenes from Prague to, you know, to Beijing. No matter what it is, we're trying to pay attention to what bands are happening, what is moving people. That, that, that first level, those first level of people in the know, you know, not the mass majority. And if you can bring that to our awareness, if we don't know about it already, um, you know, chances are we're going to pay attention. We try to, we, 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 um, we put our personal taste into the mix, but we, we always assume that our personal taste has nothing to do with it. If a band is important, you know, to a certain amount of kids somewhere, and we feel that that band is going to explode at some point or has the ability to explode, then we put our personal taste aside. It has nothing to do with us. Again, it has to do with kids that are going to play that game in the future. Um, when it comes to composers, the best thing to do is you got to network the, and survey the sort of landscape. you got to get an agent, somebody to represent you as a, as, as a composer. It's very difficult to walk in as a standalone musician and say, hey, I want to compose. You need to have somebody represent you. I'd say the f people in the film industry would say the same thing to you. Um, as for, you know, getting in touch with people in the game industry, you know, again, it's a networking opportunity out there. Uh, you've got to attend conferences. You've got to study the industry. Uh, as for being an executive in the game industry, uh, you know, there's a few industry, a few game companies that are starting to do what we do. I know that Activision has uh, someone who does something similar to us. Uh, some of the game uh, companies have licensing people, but they don't have supervisors yet. Um, 
you know, again, you need to you need to find out who the person is in charge of music is as, as of those companies and go in there and uh, create a relationship. One thing that we have done, it depends on who's watching this and how old they are, where they are. We hire college interns. You know, we we have relationships with a lot of colleges across the U.S., from Berkeley to USC and places in between. And we will, once a semester, bring in a an intern who we believe has the ability to get incorporated into the department. Uh, we just hired out of five years. Uh, we just hired our second one. Um, but you know what? That's okay. You know, um, we pay attention. If somebody is spectacular and we feel that there's a potential future for them in this industry, we'll hire them.